thinking about what I've always often thought of, which is um, cross-domain parallels, so that the idea that we can learn something about a particular phenomenon by looking at the behavior of a related phenomenon in a different domain. And um, because I come from degree semantics, I'm mostly interested in um, strictly ordered domains, so domains in which we can, uh, or we, it's most useful to think of the entities as strictly ordered with respect to one another, so the degree domain is one of those domains, the temporal domain is another one of those domains, um, and um, you can think about spatial prepositions, whatever, whatever it is that spatial prepositions do in terms of vectors, which is another sort of similar mathematic object, and I won't talk about those today, although there is an appendix that, that brings <coughs> these things together. Um, uh, my work today is, is, is uh, a work in progress, so I just want you to keep that in mind. What I'm going to do is sort of present to you a cross-domain perspective on a very popular topic these days. Um, and use a cross-linguistic survey to sort of see about the extent to which um, we can draw conclusions about the behavior of before and after from what we know about the behavior of degree constructions. Um, and I'll just do a spoiler um, right up front. Um, we do see the universality um, that, 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 um, that a pragmatic viewpoint predicts, and I'll, I'll say exactly what I mean by that later. Um, but there's a funny wrinkle in my data that I, I sort of want help with. So I think this talk is the best of both worlds. It's got you know, clear predictions that are clearly instantiated, but also some very frustrating uh, problems with the linguistic data. So there's a little bit for everyone, hopefully. Um, okay, so um, I'm sort of, I was called explaining earliest uh, because this is an operator that's been uh, postulated to um, deal with the semantics of before and after. And there's a sense in which it uh, has a strong parallel in maximality operators, which have been proposed for degree construction. So I'll first start by talking about uh, this maximality operator. So the semantics of degree constructions has motivated the implementation of a max operator, uh, which we can think of as a function from a set of degrees to its maximal member. Uh, there's a sense in which this operator is unsatisfying. Um, it, we don't really have an explanation for why it isn't latest, or sorry, it isn't minimum. Or, uh, we don't have an explanation uh, for uh, why it's there. Um, and we uh, therefore uh, make funny typological predictions or cross linguistic predictions. We predict that there might be a language whose degree constructions don't invoke max or instead invoke min, something like that. So um, I think, as with any null operator, the cross linguistic predictions that this makes uh, um, are a little. Uh, uncomfortable. Um, as a result, um, there have been proposals to reduce max uh, to a more pragmatic principle of maximal informativity, and, and that's the pragmatic principle that I, I was uh, alluding to earlier, and I'll go into more detail about this. Here's the parallel I'm interested in. Um, intriguing differences between before and after have caused um, some, and in particular Weaver and Kondorovdi, to posit an earliest operator in the temporal domain. We've got the exact same problems with this. Why is it not latest? Would we expect to see a language that doesn't, whose before and after semantics doesn't involve an earliest operator? Um, if so, how can we explain that it's mandatory cross-linguistically? Um, and so as a result of these worries, some have suggested that we should think about earliest also in terms of maximal informativity. Um, if it's true that both of these operators are better uh, characterized in terms of maximal informativity, uh, we get a few um, intriguing predictions. Um, one is the cross-domain prediction. If there's a general compulsion to maximize informativity, and if we define this in terms of uh, the maximal element of an interval or scale, then we'd expect to see the effect across all strictly ordered domains. Um, so that's the cross-domain prediction. And then the universality prediction, as I've alluded to, uh, if we thought that maxim the, the effects of maximality or earliest were in fact the result of a more pragmatic principle, we'd expect to see it cross-linguistically, its effects cross-linguistically. So it's really those two predictions that I want to focus on today, um, but um, you'll see this, it's very easy to get bogged down in the details, so I just want to make sure that that's the, the bigger picture. Um, so um, I'm not the first to think about this. Um, 
you know, Kondorovdi, in, in talking about before and after, um, uh, was probing this cross-domain prediction. Um, and I've done it in other work um, that included spatial prepositions as well. Um, so um, today I'm going to present this cross-linguistic survey. It's sort of near the end. I'm going to motivate these operators a little better for you. And as I suggested, I'll show that there's a lot of reason to think that there's a maximal, ma there's a universal maximal uniformity principle at work. Um, but there's something really tricky about the details of these languages that um, make it um, uh, yeah, a tricky conclusion to come to. So I'll just start in section one on the top of page two, give you a background of this maximality operator, just in case you're not aware. So um, we've got in three and four uh, some degree constructions that have uh, prompted the uh, uh, formulation or positing of a maximality operator. Um, the Lucinda examples in three, um, I'm uh, sorry, uh, just sort of the ungrammaticality of negative comparatives and um, how many degree questions are for. Um, we conceptualize the scale of degrees, or let's say, for instance, if we're mapping integers um, as unidirectional, strictly ordered, ranging from low to high, um, and that allows us to characterize it as an interval, and I'll go into more details about that in a second. So um, for this perspective, um, an informativity ordering on intervals um, can be conceived of as a maximality operator, and I've given Rudman's original maximality operator in five. <laughs> So um, there's a few concerns with this, um, and they came out really right away. Um, uh, the absolute formation, formulation in five doesn't generalize well to negative antonyms. So um, there's a sort of disconnect that uh, when you switch from you know, faster to slower or many to few in terms of what, what constitutes the maximum informativity versus what constitutes the maximum. I mean, it doesn't generalize well to uh, upward monotonic questions, so um, the counterpart to four. <clears throat> so if we posit a maximality operator to explain why the degree question in four prompts the maximal degree, uh, we want something to explain why we don't get a prompt for the maximal degree in an upward monotonic sentence like six, how much money can a graduate student live on? As a result of these concerns, um, a number of people have called for um, the reformulation of uh, the maximality operator, like the one you see in five, in terms of maximal informativity. This has ordering sensitivity built into it, um, and um, it allows us to sort of talk about things in a more pragmatic way if we so choose to do. Um, and there's additional evidence that this is the best way to go, and there's been some recent work um, hashing this out semantically or pragmatically accordingly. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go, so please let me know if anything's unclear. <clears throat> Alright, so um, let's talk about earliest then. Um, so just some technical preliminaries. Um, I'm going to use the terms main clause and embedded clause to talk about the arguments of before and after. Um, I'm also going to assume uh, that um, the two arguments of before and after at some level denote eventualities that can be mapped to their temporal extension or their run times via a homomorphism, um, and that we can represent the, one, the run times of events um, using a set of times, which, because we assume they're strictly ordered, we can uh, represent uh, even more conveniently as intervals. Um, and it's going to become relevant here, uh, the difference between closed and open intervals. And I've illustrated that in seven. I think I've got a definition in the appendix. But essentially, um, Natural language sort of uses both sorts of intervals, um, and in fact, they also, it also uses partially closed intervals. Um, 7a is a good illustration of a closed interval. I've illustrated it um, on the right there using closed brackets. Jane studied from 6 to 8. This is a closed interval because uh, the endpoints are included in the extension of the event or the runtime of the event. Jane studied from after 6 to before 8. I've illustrated this with round um, parentheses. Um, and that's a way of indicating that the endpoints, despite the fact that they define the interval, are not themselves included in the extension of the event at one time. Um, and that distinction is going to become important um, as things get more and more confusing. So at the top of page three, I just wanted to sort of tell you about the history of the semantics of before and after. Um, it started with a really phenomenal paper in 1964 by Elizabeth Anscombe. Um, who was, uh, as far as I know, the first to recognize that before and after are not duals, strictly speaking. There are a number of semantic asymmetries between the two that have puzzled those interested in the semantics of these constructions. 
So she focused uh, primarily on the fact that um, before but not after is associated with a transitive and anti-symmetric relation. I'm going to sort of um, not focus on those asymmetries um, in part because I think they fall out from the other ones. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on, on two other observations that were made um, um, after Anscombe <clears throat> that linguists have been more, um, more focused on. So an additional asymmetry after but not before is veridical, which, uh, uh, by which I mean it entails the truth of its internal argument. So the data in A illustrate this. Mozart died before he finished the Requiem does not entail that he finished the Requiem. In fact, you might get an anti entailment there. A, B, Mozart died after he finished the Requiem does in fact entail. So after is, is veridical um, and before is non-veridical. We can hash that out a bunch of different ways. Uh, but that's what I'll refer to as the verticality asymmetry. And then another asymmetry uh, illustrated in non is that before but not after licenses NPRs. And you might not be surprised to hear that this is one of the most intriguing asymmetries to the linguists. <coughs> um, so um, Anscombe's um, original analysis um, actually accounts for all of these facts. Um, and you'll see that original analysis in 10. Uh, the main difference, as you see, is that before encodes in part a universal quantifier, where um, after encodes two existential quantifiers. And as Anscombe herself shows, that this accounts for, uh, for the transitivity and anti-symmetry asymmetries. Um, but as Beaver and Kondorovti show, it also accounts for the verticality and MPI asymmetries. Um, I'm not going to sort of walk you through that because I'll be walking you through that for, for Beaver and Kondorovti's proposal. Um, but Beaver and Kondorovti never, nevertheless had some issues um, with Anscombe's analysis. They claimed that it didn't uh, get the correct truth conditions for these before and after sentences, which you know, from my perspective, is really the top priority. <laughs> Uh, and so there were uh, two, at least two sentences that they gave to illustrate this. Um, I'm not so happy about the first argument. Um, I like the second argument a lot better. You'll see that there are still other truth conditional problems with this analysis, the ones that didn't come up directly in Beaver Kondorovti. So if you feel yourself clinging to the Anscombe analysis, just hold up. I think you might eventually not like it. Um, Beaver Kondorovti argued that uh, by virtue of the fact that before is characterized as encoding a universal quantifier, it had a problem uh, with um, uh, um, uh, triviality. So they argued that the sentence, uh, squares had four sides long before David made a clean sweep of all the gold medals in the Sydney Olympics, is true in, even in worlds in which David has never won a gold medal, just by virtue of the fact that it codes this um, universal quantifier. Um, I have a footnote uh, they're discussing that I'm not sure about how much of a problem this is. But as I said, there are other problems. So the second problem, uh, they claimed it predicts that the sentence, uh, so it's just issues with temporal or measure phrase modifies. So the sentence, Cleo left exactly five seconds before David saying, they argue that this Anscombe analysis predicts that it holds of each time in the temporal extension of David singing, this, this five second gap, which is an impossible. So that, those were Beaver and Kondorovsky's problems with Anscombe's analysis, and this is what historically prompted them to postulate this earliest operator. So you'll see that analysis in 11. Both before and after relate some time in the main clause interval to the earliest time in the embedded clause interval. And you can just see the asymmetry <coughs> here on its face. Earliest is an absolute maximality operator and the way we've been thinking about things. It picks out the earliest time, whether you're talking about a before scale or an after scale, if you think those are ordered. Um, and so that's where the um, asymmetries um, sneak in. We've got a before relation combining with earliest in 11a and an after relation combining with earliest in 11a. Um, they characterized earliest really just as a um, uh, counterpoint, uh, counterpart of Ruhlmann's maximality operator um, uh, as um, yeah, it's the left <coughs> bound element. Um, and Krifka formulates it for them um, uh, in 12. You see that? Crucially, um, it's only defined if there is a left bound uh, on the interval, um, which is to say um, it's only defined if the event is instantiated, and that becomes important in their discussion of the verticality. 
So it's, it's as Krivka formalizes it, it's like a definite description in that respect. So uh, I'll start at the top of page uh, four now. So it's this definedness condition that results in the uh, verticality asymmetry. Um, and you'll see in 13 there's motivating data. Um, if the embedded clause is not instantiated in the world of evaluation, they claim, earliest is then relativized to an expanded domain of worlds, those that are closely related to the world of evaluation. So they allow for it in the case of an undefined event or an uninstantiated event to be relativized to close possible worlds. And Kondorovdi 2010, which is sort of like a sequel to this paper, um, explicitly formalizes that relativization if you're uncomfortable with it being implicit. Um, and then we get the verticality asymmetry for free from whatever right branching um, model of history that we've got. Um, and the NPI asymmetry uh, follows just as it does in Anscombe's analysis. It just predicts that before creates a downward entailing environment in its embedded clause or after it doesn't. Is, so what I hope to have just done is explain to you what a maximality operator is and why we've chosen to use it, and also what an earliest operator is and why we've chosen to use it. Um, before I go on to talk about um, whether we can characterize both of these things instead as a maximal informativity operator, I have to raise a few sort of empirical hiccups with the account that we're currently working with, namely the earliest account. And those hiccups will stay with us, as you see. Um, and they make, they make the data a lot messier than, than you'd expect. So um, it's probably an unfair characterization, but um, I, f I feel like both, um, both of these um, guys, you know, Anscombe and Beaver and Kondorovdi, focus so much on the verticality and NPI asymmetries, uh, they lost sight of the truth condition in an important way. So um, there's a few ways in which before and after our axions are sensitive, which, which I'm taking to mean, or I'm using to mean, sensitive to the um, axions are class of, in particular, the embedded clause, but it's not necessarily just the embedded clause. I'm actually going to start um, by talking about 15, so this is the, the, the way in which before is axions are sensitive, because the problem, the, uh, the way in which after is axions are sensitive is actually less problematic for me, and I don't want to distract you with that. Um, but we can talk about after um, whenever you'd like. So let's, let's look at 15 first. In 15a, I got before with an embedded state, and that behaves exactly as you'd expect with the earliest analysis that you saw in 11. John met Mary before she was president. Intuitively, it's true, um, if and only if um, John met Mary before the initial point of her presidency. So that's the earliest point. Great. Um, but that's not how 15b is interpreted. John met Mary before she climbed to the top of the mountain and embedded accomplishment is actually interpreted with respect to the final or latest point of the, uh, uh, of the interval. So we interpret that as meaning, as compatible, sorry, with John and Mary meeting halfway up the mountain. So as long as they met before there was a summiting, we take that sentence to be true. So here's a situation in which intuitively, if you think of an accomplishment, as a sort of non-singleton interval uh, and the way we've been representing the state, uh, then we've got a reversing of the truth conditions. Whereas 15A relates the matrix event time to the initial point of the embedded event time, 15B relates the initial, uh, the, sorry, the matrix event time to the um, final point of the embedded clause. Um, and this is, a big problem, um, but it's not one that Beaver and Kondorovdi were unaware of. It, it was um, written about extensively in Heinemacher's 1974 dissertation. So Beaver and Kondorovdi did account for it, um, and you'll see a bunch of different approaches to these di this sort of wrinkle at the top of page 5. So Beaver and Kondorovdi, in their initial proposal, treated this difference that you saw in 15 by arguing that it's wrong to assume that accomplishments are mapped to a full interval runtime. There's something about accomplishments and maybe the salience of the telos, or their endpoint, um, that um, means that they're only mapped to singleton points. 
representing their final point. So if you're dealing with an accomplishment, there's only one relevant runtime, and it happens to be the telos. So the distinction between the initial point and the final point comes out in the wash. That's the Beaver and Kondorovdi treatment of 15. Kondorovdi does things a little differently, and it's in part because she's more focused on um, sentences in which the embedded clause is associated with multiple events, so ones with quantifiers in the embedded clause. So she um, redefines earliest in a much more complicated way to involve two different sort of sorts of operations. Um, one sort of gathers um, all of the right bound or the latest points in the relevant accomplishments, um, and that's I top. And then the other one takes the earliest of those ones. Multi-level approach. Um, and in previous work that we may or may not have time to talk about later, um, I've uh, tried to propose a general pragmatic version that analyzes um, accomplishments as partially closed intervals with the initial point and the um, end point like this, and then define maximal informativity to only care about closed bounds. That's another way you can do it. Okay, so I'm at the interim summary on the middle of page five. We've got an earliest analysis that successfully accounts for um, the veridicality asymmetry that we saw, the NPI asymmetry we saw, and with some tweaking, you've got at least three tweaks to choose from the, before, the truth conditions of before and after. Um, so back to the original sort of broad agenda, we want to see if we can assimilate, sorry, if we can explain all of these semantic effects by appealing to a more general, possibly pragmatic maximal informativity principle as opposed to encoding it semantically <coughs> in a null operator. And that's where our cross-linguistic and cross-domain predictions come in. <clears throat> Focus on the cross-linguistic predictions. So, if it were true that before and after encoded this null earliest operator, we would predict that it's possible that not all languages display these semantic properties that we've seen. So that's the universality prediction. But because it solves all of these, or addresses, or accounts for all of these asymmetries in one fell swoop, we also expect that these properties are correlated. So if we see a language that demonstrates one of them, modular independent explanations, we expect it to demonstrate the others. So we expect the truth conditions to be tied to the NPI asymmetry to be tied to the veridicality asymmetry. Modulo semi-dependent. So that's the thing that I set out to test with this um, Everyone clear? I should say that the survey especially is joint work with Daniel Altshuler. I don't want to drag his name into this too far though because a, a lot of this thinking has been outside of uh, consultation with him. So at the very least, he's, he's helped me formulate some of these questions and, and do the survey. Um, all right, so um, we consulted native speakers of 17 languages from seven different language families, and I'm starting at the top of page six now. Uh, we consulted um, graduate students in linguistics. Um, so we, we really wanted, to, uh, these are very subtle judgments, we really wanted to make sure um, that, uh, uh, that these people were trying to think seriously about linguistic intuitions. They were um, fluent in English as well as uh, their native language. And the survey was done at least initially over email, um, and then we did follow-ups on the languages we were sort of most, shall we say, intrigued by, um, uh, either over email or in person as a case. So I already gave you the spoiler at the beginning. We found a lot of these properties to be universal in a way that's very encouraging for this maximal informativity project. So every language in the survey without exception demonstrated a veridicality asymmetry between before and after with after clauses being necessarily veridical. And you've got the Hungarian data there just to sh show you what, what we have in mind. There's an interesting morphosemantic sort of footnote on all of this, um, it's that some languages in the survey optionally allow irrealis marking in these embedded clauses. They do not allow irrealis marking in um, after sentences, but they do in before sentences. Um, in these languages, an irrealis marker correlated with a non-veridical reading. The irrealis marker correlated with the, real, uh, the veridical meaning just as you'd expect. 
Um, I think this happens to be very good uh, evidence that this veridicality is an under-specification in English, which goes contrary to Fever and Kondorovdi's position, but that's even more of a footnote. Um, and the NPI asymmetry we found to be essentially universal. Every language in the survey, with one exception that I'll discuss in a second, if NPIs were licensed under temporal relations at all, they were licensed under before and not after, as exemplified um, in 2100. Um, Greek and Spanish, um, NPIs were licensed under neither. Um, and then just onto this exception, it's important to uh, keep in mind that we need some morphosemantic wiggle room in this claim. So um, there's a very cool paper by Del Prete on Italian. Um, and he argued that um, although um, dopo, the Italian word for after, is a temporal preposition just like its English counterpart, um, prima, the Italian word for before, is actually something like a comparative, more like a comparative. So morphologically it looks like a comparative, and semantically it behaves like a comparative. And there's all this diachronic evidence that it, it's really more like earliest, or earlier, sorry, earlier, and not a preposition like before. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that um, there's more than one way to talk about temporal precedence. I've been assuming and focusing on um, um, temporal prepositions like before and after. Um, but it's possible that we can also have things like earliest and later sneaking in here. Um, and I think that's what we have um, in Serbo-Croatian, which is this exception that I've mentioned. Um, so Serbo-Croatian has two different words for after. I'm at the bottom of page six. One of these words um, does license NPI, so this seems to go against the NPI asymmetry, universality of the NPI asymmetry. Um, but the one that licenses NPIs is not morphologically related to before. So we seem to have two morphologically related antonyms, before and after. Those behave perfectly well. And then there's another after that behaves the contrary to what we expect. So I'm, you know, we haven't analyzed Serbo-Croatian in full detail. I'm optimistic that it'll turn out um, that this um, second Serbo-Croatian NPI will be more like a comparative Comparatives license NPIs in their embedded clause just as a, as a, as a rule, and, and so that's the best way of thinking. But other than Serbo Croatian, we have complete universality of the NPIs in the tree as well, which I think is very good evidence for this maximal informativity process, or uh, maximal informativity project. Okay. Now, this is where the complications come. So if you want to just turn your brain off because you're at peace with this idea of maximal informativity, now is a good time. I think it's still very easy to support, um, but I've got a lot of work to do wading through some particulars um, in these data, um, and I'd love your help. <clears throat> so um, the problem that I've got is actually presented in section 3.4, <clears throat> and it's a problem with a cross-linguistic difference in truth conditions. I think it would be the case, if I had seen these data and these differences in truth conditions, I would have written it off as badly collected data. But it turns out that the difference in truth conditions that I got um, was correlated with a different difference that I got, one that seems a little more morphosyntactic. And that makes it a much more serious difference in my mind. So I hope you're following the narrative, the, 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 the narrative. Um, what I'm first going to do is show you this sort of different morphosyntactic difference that I saw, which is also an interesting consideration for the syntax and semantics of before and after. And then I'm going to show you what I'm really genuinely worried about, which is a difference in truth, a cross linguistic difference in truth conditions. I hope that's clear. So first, just talking about the syntactic distribution of this morphosyntactic distribution. Of this. Um, we found a three-way crucially not four-way typology among our languages with respect to whether these languages were able to embed statives under, before, and after. <clears throat> so um, English qualifies as a type one language because in English, both before and after embed statives. <coughs> There's also a type three language 
uh, uh, which Greek, Japanese, and Russian belong, to which they belong, <coughs> in which neither before nor after seems to be able to embed status. We also found a type 2 language, uh, which we called state of asymmetrical, in which before embeds statives, but after doesn't. Crucially, we found no fourth type, where we have the different, the reverse asymmetry. So I think that's interesting enough for um, 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 a theory of before and after, although it may or may not have something to do with specifically with before and after. Um, Estonian is a type one language, just like English, exemplified in 22. Um, the criteria we used um, to classify these languages are um, uh, right below 22. We wanted to make sure that both sentences um, were reported to be equally acceptable and that both sentences were reported to be interpretable. Um, Russian is exemplified in, uh, a type is exemplifying a type three language there in 23. Both sentences were reported to be equally unacceptable. No true conditions uh, were able to be given. Um, many of our um, consultants reported that these sentences would be acceptable with an encode of predicate in place of the state of one, which is one of the things that sort of suggests to me that this is maybe a, a morphosemantic or morphosyntactic issue that's possibly independent of before and after. Um, and then we got a few type two languages exemplified um, by Dutch and Hungarian in 24 and 25. <coughs> So these are sentences in which the bef uh, languages in which the before sentences were reported to be grammatical and interpretable, um, but the after sentences were characterized as degraded or confusing without any code of predicate or an adverb, something like already or still. And as I mentioned, I think it's notable that there is no fourth type of language, at least uh, as we saw. So again, I, I find this interesting. I find it potentially independent of the semantics of before and after. I have no idea what to do with it. But the reason why I'm presenting it to you right now is that it appears to be correlated with a problem that I'm much more concerned with or much more interested in for the semantics of before and after. So um, section 3.4, just a reminder, um, I haven't talked to you about the axioms are sensitivity of after, uh, but we did talk about the axioms are sensitivity of before, in particular, when before embeds accomplishments in English, uh, the accomplishment is interpreted with respect to its final point or its end point. But if it encode, uh, embeds other eventualities, um, that sentence is interpreted with respect to the initial point that the embedded mm -hmm. Um I found evidence that um, language is different before in how they interpret these before and accomplishment sentences. We found no other variation in truth conditions. So no variation with the semantics of after sentences, no variation with respect to the semantics of before and status or anything like that. So um, there are some languages that interpret before and accomplishment sentences with respect to the initial point and not the final point. And the thing that I think makes this particularly challenging is that these languages are all and only the type two languages in that typology that I mentioned before, for reasons that are mystifying. Um, and so you'll see in table one, um, the data that we found um, sort of, yeah. Uh, so English is a type one language. Um, uh, this is just the semantics of before, so that we interpret uh, before plus accomplishments with respect to the final point. Type two languages is always with respect to the initial point. Um, so I've got some more type one languages at the bottom of page eight, and at the top of page nine you can see some of these type two languages. Um, inevitably, we will start talking about what these data looked like, and I, I regret that I don't have all of the type 2 data on the handout for you to scrutinize. Um, I'll tell you what I did. I, 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 I asked, so we, we asked for two different sentences, climb to the top and paint the house. I asked that the consultants uh, match my morphology as much and as well as they possibly could. So not shifting from to to towards, using the top of the mountain, in this case specifying the top, just to sort of hold everything as fixed as possible. I asked them to keep, you know, um, adverbs out of it uh, and, and so forth and so on. So I did my best um, in that, from that perspective to try and control for um, morphological um, differences across these languages, but I may not have done a good enough job, admittedly. Um, 
it's possible that the context in 31 is too confusing, um, but I thought that this might be a good illustration of the difference in meaning. So the context is right before John starts a climb, he puts on a very silly hat. So this sort of, once you see the silly hat, you know that you've passed the initial point. So the question um, that I gave my consultants is whether or not it was felicitous in that context to say one of these continuations. Thank goodness that Mary met John before he climbed to the top of the mountain. Because if she had met him while he was wearing the hat, she never would have been able to take him seriously. That should sound funny in English, although maybe convoluted. Because our sentence in English does not entail that she did not see him wearing the hat. So the English version of the sentence is compatible with her having met him while he was wearing the hat. Because the English sentence only requires that they have met before the summiting, not before the hat wearing. I wonder if it would be helpful if I repeated that. Okay. Maybe I'll draw a mountain. So it seems weird in this context to say, thank goodness Mary met John before he climbed to the top of the mountain, because she never would have taken him seriously if he was wearing that silly hat. That should be weird in English, because that sentence in English is compatible with Mary having met him here, in which case he would have been wearing the hat. So it would be weird to say, thank goodness she didn't meet him while he was wearing that hat. This Look, if you understood me before I started talking about this example, then, then you're fine. I just thought that this might be a helpful Not just thing. compatible, but it pragmatically infer, infers that it's that it, that it in the middle, because otherwise you wouldn't say, you just would say before, you, before you start climbing, as opposed to yeah, climbing at climb the top. <laughs> it's possible that the summoning is salient for some other reason, but yeah, maybe in a neutral context, yeah, we get that information. Crucially, the type two languages um, told me that the only possible interpretation was one in which this sentence, or this context, this discourse, was acceptable because our before sentence does entail that they met before he put on that hat. So this is just me trying to, like a creative way to illustrate this difference. It seems like an important one to me. All right. <clears throat> so um, I'll just sort of wrap up. Um, I, I, I don't want to... I think the cross-linguistic data are super interesting, and, and the last thing I want to do is, is lose sight of that, and I, I would love if you guys could give me your perspective on what to do with them. But I, I just want to sort of step back a little bit and just talk about the maximal informativity project generally. I don't believe I've said anything that truly complicates our like virtuous quest for maximal informativity. Um, there's some funny things that I found in the truth conditions of my data, and if you took the universality and the, and the correlation prediction at face value, we would expect to see any language that has the verticality asymmetry to have the MPI asymmetry and to have the exact same truth conditions because all three of these things were treated with the earliest operator in the Beaver and Kondorovji account. But the problem I ran into, the differences in truth conditions that I ran into, were already sort of weird complications with the earliest operator. Which is to say, there were already, uh, you know, the before and accomplishment sentences where the earliest operator needed to be sort of finessed um, according to the data. So it's possible that we just need a different notion of maximal, maximal informativity, uh, one that treats accomplishments accordingly, and one that has this cross-linguistic variation. I'm not comfortable with the idea of a pragmatic principle sort of having cross-linguistically different truth condition predictions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it seems like these differences between languages might, might be bigger than the before and after differences, and I'm just not sure what they are. I just want to say before I close that um, a number of speakers of type 2 languages proposed to me 
that they were getting just the sort of coercion that Beaver and Condorandi expected. Um, so you can imagine um, that a language, there's a language that um, coerces this into like a singleton interval with just the endpoint, and you can imagine a language that coerces this into a singleton interval with just the initial point. Um, and that might explain the cross-linguistic variation. If you get yourself into a, a situation in which there's no difference between the initial um, and the end point, um, then you might expect to see these sorts of differences. I'll just say that it's not clear to me how far we can ride this hypothesis, because the languages um, that told me that they might have something like an encoative operator in these embedded clauses were actually getting the type one before final interpretations. So, I mean, this is one way of thinking about the complication of the data. But it's not clear to me how, how, how useful it'll be. Um, all right, and I think I'll leave it at that and then just take your questions. Thanks.